We're used to thinking history is guided by people, those who change governments through elections, movements or revolutions, or those notable historical figures, presidents, monarchs, dictators. But what about the role of pandemics in our history? From plague to smallpox and cholera, COVID-19 is the latest in a long line of diseases to alter our lives. In this video, we're gonna look at how pandemics have shaped history and whether we can learn anything from them in today's world. Now the first three pandemics we're gonna look at were all outbreaks of bubonic plague. That's a disease caused by the bacterium Yersinia pestis, which was carried by infected fleas from small animals, mainly from rats. One of the most notable symptoms of the plague was the infection and enlargement of the lymph nodes. The kind of huge black boils or buboes as they were called, which gave rise to the name bubonic plague. These boils are filled with pus, they burst, it's quite disgusting. The first recorded pandemic of bubonic plague was the Plague of Justinian, named after the Eastern Roman Emperor who himself got it and recovered. It's believed the plague emanated from Asia and made its way to Africa. It first appeared in the Egyptian port of Pelusium in 541. It then reached the capital of the Byzantine Empire, Constantinople, in 542, and then moved outwards, reaching Ireland to the west and Syria to the east. How did it spread? Well, the plague was closely tied to the empire Justinian built. The rats moved with the ships and the fleas moved with the ships and the carts and the textiles. The disease was made possible by a very impressive communication system. The plague had an impact on the Byzantine Empire. Before the pandemic struck, Justinian had reconquered a lot of former territory. While it's disputed how many died during this period, contemporary accounts spoke of the plague ravaging the population. That meant the taxpayer base was reduced and that revenue had helped fund the army that expanded the empire. His troops were weakened in the competition, the conflicts with the Goths coming in from northern, northeastern Europe. So it did have a serious effect. The territory Justinian controlled before the plague would never be matched again during the Byzantine era. Today with COVID-19, will it also cause a disruption on the international stage? We've already seen divisions within the European Union over countries differing responses to the pandemic. The bubonic plague would re-emerge in waves across Europe until the 18th century. One notable outbreak occurred in 1347, the Black Death. Again, this was about armies and trading routes. The Mongols, who were moving from east to west, are believed to have carried the disease to the Crimea, and from there it moved to Constantinople and the trading routes of the Mediterranean. And it kills between 30 and 50% of the population of Europe. In some places in England, it kills up to 80% of the population. But there was the emergence of some practical responses to the plague. In Italian city-states, surveillance and quarantine began to be used. With the plague often being carried on board ships, sailors were isolated for a few weeks. Hence the word quarantine, which comes from the Italian for 40 days. So there is a developing sense that isolation and shutdown of commercial activities and movement um, is effective in restricting the spread of subsequent outbreaks. The Black Death ravaged the continent. The population of England did not recover until the 17th century. A smaller population meant two things. With fewer people, more land became available, and a shortage of labor meant those who survived demanded higher wages. That leads to governments in England trying to stop laborers asking for more money. That creates discontent. So you have things like the Peasants' Revolt in 1381. Of course, the reaction to this discontent across the continent was different. And some historians argue that the Black Death is an important moment in the development of European society. Parts of, of Eastern Europe and Southern Europe, serfdom is reimposed. Whereas in Northwest Europe, serfdom begins to be bargained away after the Black Death. And, and Western Europe is taking the first tentative steps towards liberal modernity. Today with COVID-19, will it also cause a significant shift? Some are arguing this could be a reckoning for capitalism as it goes through such a major crisis. It's important to remember that plague was something endemic in Europe throughout this period. One particular outbreak is now infamous partly because it was so well documented, the Great Plague of London. It's believed to have killed 100,000 Londoners in just 18 months. There's a story of a young woman who's seen carrying a small homemade coffin to consecrated land, so she's obviously burying her own child herself. King Charles fled London as it struck, as did many other wealthy individuals, and it was the lower and middling classes who had to deal with quarantine. Authorities locked up entire households if anyone had the plague, and a red cross would mark the house with a watchman standing guard outside. 
This saw the sick locked up with the healthy to devastating effect. And that's why we see so many families dying together. And that's why when you look in the parish burial records, you see the same surname over you know, a number of days until you get the last name. And there's, there's nobody there to, to write down the first name of that person. You just have their last name. During the Great Plague of London, we see signs of people disobeying authorities because they saw quarantine as unfair. The government is becoming involved in everyday life in a way that it hadn't been before. And it partly does it not just because of disease, it also does it deliberately as a form of social control. So the poor laws come about in this period too. So the poor laws are partly to provide money for the needy, but it's also to control those people who are wandering about or don't have work. I certainly think the bubonic plague may ha had a huge role in how the state then rolled itself out from, from the centre into the localities. Are there comparisons for today? Certainly, protests have been seen across the United States as a minority of citizens complain about lockdowns. As the plague pandemic began to fade, a new deadly disease was beginning to worry people, smallpox. It's got a long history. The disease is believed to have originated more than 3,000 years ago in either India or Egypt. Its symptoms included fever, vomiting, the creation of sores in the mouth and a skin rash. There may be hundreds of pox on the face and it may become confluent, that is those pox or pustules would merge together. And uh, that of course was a clear sign of, uh, of, a, of a fatal outcome. Now, if we think of how COVID-19 has affected the likes of Boris Johnson and Prince Charles, think about the effects smallpox had on leading figures back then. It killed Prince William, Duke of Gloucester, the only child of Queen Anne, prompting a succession crisis that caused the Act of Settlement in 1701 that in turn led to the Hanoverian dynasty. Smallpox killed the Emperor of Russia, Peter II, at the age of just 14 in 1730, ending the direct male line of the Roman of dynasty. And it brought to an end the 59 year reign of Louis XV for France in 1774, placing an unqualified 19 year old Louis XVI on the throne. Smallpox even played a role in the conquest of the New World in this period. Because Europeans had some form of exposure and immunity, when they brought it across the Atlantic, the indigenous populations there were exposed to a completely new virus. The first smallpox epidemic that we know of that uh, hit the Americas was in 1520, and it actually uh, assisted Hernan Cortez's uh, conquest of the Mexica or Aztec people uh, in central Mexico. Uh, it, it was tremendously influential. Now at this time, inoculation was beginning to be used, the practice of exposing people to the virus to make them immune. During the American Wars of Independence, smallpox inoculation was used to great effect by George Washington. So in the winter of 1777, 1778, that famous Valley Forge winter that was so horrific for the American army, um, he actually had his troops undergo inoculation. It meant that George Washington's army was for the most part invulnerable to smallpox in the years to come. And I think that was one of his most important decisions of the war. There was still hesitation in using inoculation. It was only until Edward Jenner came along at the end of the 18th century that things really changed. The English physician realized that inoculating people with cowpox, a milder form of the virus, seemed to be safer, pioneering the first smallpox vaccination. It really was a sort of, you know, a good tidings moment, promoted like a sort of gospel, you know, this is a, this is going to be the salvation of everyone and this is wonderful and we can all uh, move beyond smallpox. In 1980, the World Health Organization declared the global eradication of smallpox. Today with COVID-19, we can clearly see how far we've come in terms of treating viruses. And indeed, there is already talk of a vaccine possibly coming sooner rather than later. Now, as we've seen, diseases have often been carried via trading routes or by expanding empires. Cholera was no different. That's a disease which is spread to the West by trading routes, by merchants who can move from northeastern India where it's endemic. As the virus spreads, there's great fear from the population and conspiracy theories start to circulate about doctors. Accusing them in Britain in the early 1830s of killing off people with this new unknown agent in order to provide bodies for the anatomy schools for demonstrations. Two things emerged during the cholera outbreak. Firstly, cities began to be redesigned. People like Edwin Chadwick in London pushed for better sanitation. That's not because they realised cholera was caught from contaminated water. They believed it was passed through the air emanating from the filth of the river or the slums of the city. And so this does stimulate then a big cleanup of European cities called the hygienic revolution. The improving health of people comes not from medical changes, but from improved housing, nutrition, hygiene, 
A better understanding of cholera only comes later in the century. That you have what historians call the medicalization of society, where people begin to respect uh, medical science as it begins in the 19th century to discover the causes of all these epidemics, the causes of disease, with the advent of bacteriology, the microscope. Today with COVID-19, we see the culmination of not just the expansion of the state, but its relationship with the medical profession and public health measures. Well, that's our quick journey through more than a thousand years of pandemic history. We've seen how infectious diseases have weakened empires, given birth to peasant movements, and even played a role in wars and conquest. Perhaps the big question now is this, will the coronavirus crisis signal a shift in our society today? Only time will tell. But remember, as unprecedented as this moment feels, we've been here before. As one historian wrote, infectious disease will remain one of the fundamental parameters and determinants of human history.